are back this Saturday. So next set of guests I've got for you to meet, Rare Alton, Ben Calder and Chris Burt, all from Shropshire Festival, which has taken me a while to get my tongue round, but I think I've just about managed it. Give me the, what's happening. It's the first time this has ever happened, isn't it? It is. So um, basically we wanted to put together um, an event that looked at giving people information and advice and food and drink based basically around the free farm theme. Um, it started off just looking at the basics of gluten-free and dairy-free, and then it's grown, so we've got a plastic-free theme and a free from technology kids' area and a cookery theatre, lecture theatre, producers. So we're hoping it's going to be quite, um, well, a brilliant event. I noticed that you are on the, the What's On list with a lecture entitled Food and Fibromyalgia. That's right. I know what one of those things is. I don't know what the other is. <laughs> so um, enlighten me. So fibromyalgia is a condition that a lot of people suffer from um, that involves um, a variety of symptoms like um, fatigue um, and irritable bowel syndrome, okay. and sort of all sorts of problems like that. Um, and one of the ways of keeping, not keeping it under control, but basically assisting the symptoms is using free from food. But it's one of those things where Nobody's actually really said exactly what you should do. Different people do different things. And I thought it would be really great, as a sufferer myself, to basically get everyone in a room and have a discussion about what foods they are free from. Share tips almost. Yeah, share tips. How it how it's affected them, how they... Um, for example, I, I do low gluten and low dairy um, just because I find that easier to enjoy food mm. more yes um, but obviously there are people who do no gluten and no dairy and i would like to find out from them the sorts of things because it's living without cheese do. living at all well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know that's the sort of thing we want to chat about so i thought it'd be a really good place where everybody was sort of in one place and there may be a lot of people who are free from due to fibromyalgia so that we can have a chat about it. on a serious note how, how much does it impact your day-to-day -day life for me, I've done really well in the fact I'm very lucky that it doesn't impact me too much. A lot of people with fibromyalgia don't work at all. Okay. Um, so it can I, be really debilitating. It can be, yeah. Um, I run my own business and I have a fantastic business partner and a great husband. So it means I can work when I can work and when mm. I can't work and when I can't look after the children, other people step in for me. So I'm really lucky in that sort of way. Painful? Yeah, it can, it can be extremely painful. It, it's hard to know... Um, sometimes whether you've got fibromyalgia or whether you've actually twisted a muscle or pulled yeah. a muscle because it can be sort of that sort of pain. Um, but you get used to it after a while and you kind of understand the best ways to deal with it. So learning how to manage it is key. Yeah, yeah. And reducing and the risk of a flare-up. Exactly. And f being free from in lots of food and various things is mm. a big way of management. So, Ben, allergies and kinesiology. Yeah. Did I say that right? Kinesiology. <clears throat> kinesiology. <clears throat> pretty well, yeah. Again, I know what one of these things is. I don't know what the other is. So what, what's that about? Uh, so with kinesiology, it's a form of assessment that we uh, test muscles. So we're looking at nervous system resilience and responsiveness. And we can do that in relation to various substances because our nervous system is really observant. It's watching everything that's going on around us regardless of how aware we are. Okay. And when different substances enter into our environment, either through our, uh, our breathing, either our skin, through our digestion, the nervous system is having a response within that. So with uh, kinesiology, we can actually look at that we can assess it so we can work out complex. things uh, it, it can be incredibly complex <laughs> some of the relationships that are involved in some of these things are, are crazy but it's a really simple way <laughs> of demonstrating to people okay if you have this substance you can watch your body go weak as we enter it into your yeah. system so how have you come to become an expert in this uh, so exactly 20 years ago this year, I attended a lecture on hacking your body's computer. And right. the person who was giving it was a kinesiologist. And they were talking about ways of actually kind of getting into the unconscious aspects of the, the body mm. to learn what was going on with it. And uh, at the time, I had really severe allergic rhinitis, which is like hay fever, but all year round. And I had psoriasis. So I went up to this lady after the lecture and said, I've got these problems. Do you think you could help? Mm. And she just said to me, sit down and let's find out and that kind of began a journey into having kinesiology work done for myself having massive improvements in my health at the time and then being so excited about what was happening but also at the same time quite confused about how it was happening i put myself on a training course and so uh, Maisie, who works on the show has the rhinitis one and the 
the dairy issue okay, as well. Sure, yeah. Right. So there's a lot of people who share these. These aren't uncommon, are they? I, I tell you, just looking at some statistics for this recently, 44 percent wow. of British adults have one or more allergy. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, and that the number is only going know? up. No, uh, right. quite often they don't. So allergies don't have to be what we would say is a classic anaphylaxis. It doesn't have to be something that we see immediately. <clears throat> it can be something that takes anything up to 72 hours, and any symptom in your body can be triggered or exacerbated by an allergy. So what have you found helps with your particular issues so there's a the couple of things that are, are quite obvious the first is avoidance yeah and the second is having a good healthy diet within itself so that which is going to build your body up make it strong help your own immune system your digestive systems function properly and part of the reason why we see such an increase in these things is that the nature of food itself over the last kind of 50 60 years is changing mm. and, and what a lot of people are eating on a typical basis is nowhere near as healthier and as vibrant as it was you know back in the 1950s when mm. britain was just about at its healthiest was it really in the 1950s that was yeah, the peak sure. yep. which the... you would think is is counterintuitive well it, it was a great time for us because we still had rationing which meant a lot of the stuff that we uh needed to avoid like sugar and wheat and other things were, yeah, were quite limited. legally had to avoid it yeah, yeah sure because there wasn't much around people were doing a lot of allotment growing and because we weren't in a, a large scale kind of agro farming industry then there wasn't a lot of pesticides or fertilizers being used and people were also wild crafting so mm. people were going out into the countryside and picking whatever they could find out there that was edible and so we actually had one of the the best levels of health at that time because of all of that natural seasonal homegrown food that was being made in simple ways what's the specific stuff you have to avoid uh, so for me one of my biggest triggers is sugar right uh, so i really have to avoid that shame. one uh, <laughs> it is but thankfully due to the work that i've done with my kinesiology i do have a tolerance to it so i i can have a certain amount but if i exceed that so you know if i uh, uh, have you know a box of uh, kind of uh, chocolates or something like that, then the next day I'm going to have more mucus, I'll see sneezing coming up. Mm. So I, I kind of know my limits and I know how to manage them. And, and I just do what needs to be done to keep my gut healthy as well. So good bacteria, try and avoid fruit and vegetables that have been uh, washed in chlorine bleach because uh, that has a, an effect of sterilising the gut. Well, just the words chlorine bleach doesn't sound great, <laughs> to be yeah, honest. Sure. But just about every product that you buy every vegetable that you buy that's washed has been washed in a, a weak chlorine bleach solution i'm afraid so wow. and uh, and you see over time now you know technically the the levels of that are still within safe limits but when we're talking about doing that three or four times a day yeah over 5, 10, 15 years, you know, it's slowly, slowly the gut bacteria gets quite significantly affected and can have a massive implication, not just in our physical health, but in our mental health, inflammation, joint problems, uh, mental functioning. It's uh, quite significant stuff. Chris, you're a chef. I am indeed. Uh, how is that where your, your connection with this, this comes from, or, or do you have your own intolerances? Um, I'm just allergic to pineapple. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just, just that. Um, I'm there really to do paleo, aren't I? Which is the caveman diet. Yes. Okay. Which was oh, which... massively in fashion, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and still is, I guess. But it's, a, but it's a diet that I follow. Okay. It's, for me, I've found it, uh, I don't feel so, because I'm on my feet a lot, um, obviously working in catering. Eating a big bowl of pasta or yeah. a big bowl of noodles, which is what I used to do back in the day. I just, it, I, I can't do it anymore. So a nice, a nice piece of organic meat, some berries, some nuts. You know, there are certain foods that I avoid. I don't, I don't eat an awful lot of dairy either, because um, I find it makes me a bit sluggish and mm. mucusy. <laughs> Same sort of thing. Pretty much got rid but, of carbs. But I'm not really intolerant to it. It's just that I choose, I choose not to eat it because. There will be an effect mm. from me from me ingesting it. Do you, have you pretty much gotten the carbs? Is that part of mostly? It? Yeah. yeah, and and actually, same same at the restaurant. Obviously, there are, there are certain things you know that you're never going to be able to get rid of fish and chips and, and yeah. things like that. But actually, for the mainstay, I'll try and keep it as low carb as possible. And you know, in my industry, we have dairy, we have we have uh, dietaries in all the time. In fact. 
we we estimated that it fifteen percent of all our customers that come have some sort of either dietary intolerance or uh, simply a lifestyle choice that you know they want to avoid certain food. So we've got to be really flexible yeah. and really on it because actually sometimes removing too much from a food item will either make that into a a heavily processed item, which is what we don't want to do, because yeah. you don't want to put that in your body. We want to keep it as fresh and vibrant and light as as we possibly can. So, actually, I always consider it a real challenge. I love it. You mm. know, when people come in, you get a lot of chefs go, "Oh no, we've got we've got a, we've got a vegan that's yeah. gluten free. Brilliant, bring it on!" Because actually, that's what stimulates our creativity, and and actually, in essence, helps us find. Um, new ingredients to work with, which is great because you know you're building a repertoire of things that you can draw. You become a bit like a scientist, don't you? A bit experimental, yeah. and that's fun. But but it's great, it, honestly. It really, really is, and I'm, I'm really passionate about it. When anybody comes in with a dietary, I, there isn't one I would ever say no to. I I love it. How much better do you feel? Why do you continue to follow the diet that you do? What are the the sort of practical manifestations? Uh, I don't feel. As tired, I don't feel a CP. I'm training for a 10k run in Uganda next week, um, <laughs> and, a, and actually, it's been great because why Uganda? Uh, I'm doing it for self help Africa. Wow, so have you so, been before? No, no, this is the first, but I'm but I'm training for it. And, and actually, if I'm sat there just eating carbs, the last thing I'm going to want to do is go for a run, and the worst thing to do is do it after i've come back from a run right because i'm not i'm not actually burning it off so i'm not a big eater anyway but what i eat i want to really enjoy i want it i want it packed with flavor packed with nutrients all all the things that i need and i don't feel the need for big bowls of pasta and i'm not a, i'll have a bit of toast occasionally mm. but i'm not i'm not big into it modern food rubbish it's processed by and large it's 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 not. You've just got to be really careful about what you buy right. or, or just really knowledgeable about what you buy. Mm. You know, um, I did a did a lecture filter fork about chocolate um, a couple of weeks back. And most people in this country will buy crap chocolate. Mm. But what they don't realise is that there's hardly any cacao butter in it. It's mainly vegetable oil and sugar. Mm. That's not chocolate, you know. If you have proper chocolate, proper mm. fresh Vibrant, bitter, really take, really take, not necessarily okay. because you, you, you don't have to use processed white sugar. Like the the chocolate that I get um, contains panella, which is the sugar cane that grows in between the cacao trees. So right, okay. it's not a it's not a processed sugar, yeah. but you still get that sweet. But you don't have to put as much in. So why and it's don't, why don't things just contain good stuff? Is it because it's cheaper to produce? Of course, yeah. Because, mass producing in a way that's processed and the population is is a lot bigger than it was mm. and people you know it's convenient for them it's convenient to go into the supermarket and buy some pre-prepared chopped fruit mm. rather than just yeah. buy an apple or a banana <laughs> yeah. do you know what i mean and and it, it, for me that's the world gone mad like my son he, he, we were in the supermarket a few a few weeks ago and he was like oh look snack attack i'm like no, no. I tell you what, we'll buy some berries and we'll buy some bananas and we'll buy some oranges instead of buying something that, let's be honest, the plastic's damaging the environment. Yeah. And in essence, they're ripping you off. And what have they sprayed on it to keep it that... Co- once, once, you, yeah. once you open... And give it that shine. Yeah. And what, <laughs> what, once you open that thread in your mind, then it, it does make you look mm. at what food... We buy as consumers, and I don't. I don't buy an awful lot of food as a consumer because I'm in the catering industry, so I'm at work. So I, I consider myself privileged because I get to eat wonderful things yeah. whenever I want. Almost as you go. Yeah. Whereas actually, for somebody that's doing a nine to five, their only choice is the supermarket, or they cook fresh at home. But have they got time? Do you have to be careful as a chef not to eat too much as well. Uh, N- not from my perspective, but uh, but I've worked with chefs that yeah. uh, they will just gorge on cheese, yeah. you know. <laughs> but then if there's but then if there's some fantastic Iberico uh, ham there, you know that that's that's a good natural product. You yeah. know, olives, great na- natural product. But yeah, if there's chips left over in a bowl, what yeah. are they going to do? I personally don't do that anymore. But 
you know, I've known a lot of chefs over the years. I draw do. the line talking about cheese, ready grated. That, oh, that. <laughs> yeah, that's it's not fourteen it's not cheese. seconds. It's not cheese, it, right? It's not cheese, is it? Really? Right. Draw a poll then. Do more people have allergies, or do more people just know they have allergies now? It, do, you always get the "it wasn't like this X years ago." Is it just because people didn't know? It's both, right? So, so because of changes, I mean, as Chris has rightly said, changes in our food production, the nature of it, the convenience of it, the levels of stress in our life, and there are a number of other factors that really contribute towards these changes. So uh, more and more people are developing allergies, plus the education awareness about it is increasing. Yeah. So between uh, sort of 2012 and uh, 1992, there was something like a 614% increase increase in anaphylaxis uh, seen and in... And that's severe... Yeah, that's sure. So that's life-threatening yeah. allergy. That's not a minor intolerance, No, is no, it? no, sure. And, and again, Chris talking about how you know, he doesn't eat dairy now because he feels that mucus in there. You know, a lot of people are just not aware of how symptoms that they're having might have anything to do with their diet mm. because a lot of our eating is actually unconscious. And you know, we, we, you know, like, like Chris said, we're, we're kind of busy. We wander around. We want to eat. We grab something that kind of has a colour or a shape that we feel is okay. Hey, you're eating with your eyes, isn't it? Yeah. Rather than... Sure. With your head, yeah. yeah, and a lot of the time we're, you know, we're still on our phones, or we're still at the desk at work, or we're dealing with kids, and we're just troughing the stuff in. We don't really think about what we're eating. We're not stopping to consider it. We don't give ourselves time and space to do it. And so the way that the body is then interpreting that as it takes it in, mm. because literally eating with our eyes is a big thing. So how many people are watching the news or EastEnders or something else that isn't actually uh, nurturing and nutritive to them when they're eating, yeah. and the the body's actually going into nervous system states that could be adverse to digestion. So we might not even digest our food properly if we're running around or we're watching something on the, the TV that is anything less than, you know, I mean, I, I always recommend people are either watching comedy or watching nature. You know, if you're going to watch something while you eat and you have to have the TV on, comedy or nature, so you're laughing or you're seeing something beautiful. Yeah. You know, and if you can't do that, try not to have the TV on. You know, but that, that change in our behaviours, in our life, styles the time we have less people are taking time to prepare food and, and some of these processed foods that we see in supermarkets it's scary how long ago well, I, that they I were prepared. travel a lot covering sport and constantly on a saturday i'll eat three times and in each of those three times i'm picking the least worst option sure. you know whether it's at a service station because i'm yeah. on the motorway somewhere or at an event or you know you're constantly having to go you know, I'm not sure if there is an option here that's that's good. Are there sort of are there sort of life hacks that things that are generally available that are all right? I think lots of people struggle with um, kind of quick snacking and, yeah. and that kind of thing. What I try to do with my kids is I try to at home make sure I prepare nice things for them and that I give them all you know sorts of different veg and fruit and things like that because i know that when we go out on mm. saturday you know they're gonna a want you know things and i also want them to have it mm. because you know i don't i don't want them just to eat fruit and vegetables all the time and never to try some of because we've got planet donut coming to the festival with their vegan Love um, planet donut. oh it's amazing yeah. i mean you know i would save my health in all week to get some donuts, you know, on a Saturday. And that, so it is balance. Yeah, and I yeah, think a lot um, of it is. if I know I'm going away, I know, for example, I've been setting up the show that, you know, yesterday and today, and the office always gets pizza because, you know, <clears> everyone's working, everyone yeah. only has a very quick time for lunch. We bring in the pizzas, you know, and, and, and do that stuff. And for somebody who's gluten free, pizza is quite tough. Yes. But I think to myself, if I can just keep myself completely you know, healthy at home, I can take that pizza and eat that pizza yeah. and I'm walking it off on that showground um, so I can take that in. So I tend to try and plan the, the times that I can be good, I'd be good. But then the times that I can't be, mm. I just, you know, realise that there are limits to when you're trying to, you know, be as healthy as you can possibly be. We will go through everything you've got on because it looks quite an, an extensive plan. Ray Alton, Ben Calder and Chris Burt from Shrewsbury Fest Festival. I <laughs> did it again. <laughs> Festival which is this week, after Brian Adams.
New from Brian Adams, All or Nothing on BBC Radio Shropshire. I'm Mark Ellett. This is a seven o'clock show in conversation with Rare Alton, Ben Calder and Chris Burt, who are all part of uh, Shrewsbury Festival. Did it that time. Yeah, Shropshire yeah, Festival. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got cocky, see? Now, talk me through the, the running order and everything you've got. Who, who's in charge of that? Everyone's looking at you. I know, <laughs> I know. Yeah, technically, you. You know, I'm going to have to whip over the uh, programme okay. to, to double-check to make sure I'm... Uh... So, basically, um, the main focus of the show is on our lecture theatre and our cookery theatres. Um, it's the showground. Yes, it's okay. the Westmid showground in Coton Hill. So we have a big cookery theatre, and at 11 o'clock, Legina Masala will be uh, showing off some gluten-free goodness. Okay. Um, at 12.15, Chris will go on, and he'll do the low-carb and... The caveman. <laughs> the caveman diet. Do you like doing that, cooking in public, by the way? Oh, I, lo- I love it. Almost show love cooking. It. Uh, 12, 13 festivals last year. Oh, wow. So, and I think there's the same this year. Yeah. I love it. Wow. <laughs> there you go. We're, he was one of the first ones we approached. We knew Chris would want to get on board. We'd have been so. approaching you if you hadn't. So <laughs> it wasn't fine. Um, at Harper's Hall, you've got uh, Richard Fletcher um, from the Pheasant. He's doing our dairy free dishes. Um, so he'll be stepping up to do that. And then at 2.45, we've got Jenny Tishi. So Jenny's known as the lunchbox doctor. Um, and she prepares. Um, exactly what it says on the tin she does lunch boxes for kids um that are a bit healthier but obviously all parents want kids to be a bit healthier so she's going to mm. show them how to do it how to how to make the kids sort of a bit healthier without the kids throwing the food back at you so um <laughs> she'll step up then and then legina goes back on the stage at four o'clock to do vegan dishes so she'll be cooking up uh, some vegan delights at that time and then in our lecture theater um we have at eleven forty five we have Claire McDonald, I think it's Louis, who is doing um free from food as medicine and uh, lowering sugar. Um basically Claire has two children who had severe um allergies and problems okay. and she looked to um free from food to basically as Ben said, use it as a way to control that. And uh, lowering sugar was a big part of it. So as well as doing a lecture in the lecture theatre, she's going to be doing family workshops. So any families that go along can go in and find out how to do it. It's basic theme through F- Festival is about finding out how to do it. We don't just want to tell people mm. what they should be doing. We want to show them how. Um, and at 12.30, it's Ben. He will take to the lecture theatre stage for the... Um, Allergies and kinesiology. Yeah, and epigenetics. Yeah. And epigenetics, that's it. Um, and then at quarter past one, we've got Robin Nugent and Tom Holt from um, Paso Primero. Um, and Robin is uh, from the Market Hall. They're talking on vegan wine, basically the story of vegan wine and European wine and benefits. Why and would numbers. wine not be vegan? Well, um, now, they will it's probably better, but it's, it? it's definitely something about... Fish eggs. Yeah, they use oh, animal. I'm right. sure they use animal. Yeah, it's fish bits. findings for clarification. That is it. Yeah, That's so a lot it. of them have gluten in, surprisingly. Right. Yeah, and gelatin in some. Uh, you surprised what ends fish up in your wine. Yeah. So yeah. there's. Yeah. So they'll be wow. talking about you know why you should why any every in fact I'm I'm, I'm predicting this. Their talk. Honest, this is half the battle, isn't it? <laughs> Did you know there is this in this? Because yeah. I'm and most people would say no. Yeah. yeah. And, and all, think... all of a sudden you get a bit put off. They're going to say that you know, everybody really should be looking, you know, to, to drink vegan wine at some stage and, and try it out and and have a drink. So there'll be... Uh, and also Tom from Paso Primero and Darren from Gin Different in the Market Hall are running our bar because we've got a big free from bar um, with the vegan wine, the gin and tonic and gluten-free beers as well from Freedom. Um, and then at 2.45, Pablo Spall will uh, talk in the lecture theatre. He's talking on um, chocolate and meditation. Okay. <laughs> Which I'm quite excited about, yeah. to be honest. Chocolate meditation. By that point in the festival, you might need it. <laughs> yeah, I'll have been to the uh, free from bar <laughs> and I'll be, you know, ready for some chocolate and meditation. But he's <laughs> also got um, Forever Cacao, there's raw chocolate. Um, he's also got a stand there as well so that you can buy your raw chocolate. I think, should you want to go home and meditate? Yeah, with I've it. been to some of Pablo's uh, chocolate and meditation and I can highly recommend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really good. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward there you to go. it. <laughs> At Harper's 3, Sam Winterflood is going to talk on action on plastic. So Sam is from the new Green Options Zero Waste store that's opened in Shrewsbury. Okay, yeah. So he's going to come along and talk to people about how to reduce plastic in the home and why you should be reducing plastic in the home. And then at quarter past four, I will chair the uh, fibromyalgia talk. 
along with Ben, actually, Ben's going to join me um, so that he can chat through as well um, how different symptoms of fibromyalgia can be helped in different ways. Is this event your brainchild, your baby? <laughs> Yes, I think so. Basically, um, Ian at the um, West Midlands Showground, it was his idea. Um, and he said to me, well, you know, what, what do you think? Do you think, you know, there are enough people in mm. Shropshire and the Midlands who would want to find out about this information? Because in the office, we drink A2 milk, uh, which is the milk that's got a certain protein missing. Okay. Um, and we drink that regularly in the office. It's a bit like lactose free, but just a... Mm. Um, and we were talking over a cup of tea with A2 Milk. And he said, do you think enough people would want to find out and would want to ask the questions we ask? Because we were generally asking questions about Freeform. And I replied, yes. And there, <laughs> and there, Festival was born. And basically it's grown. But Festival is, um, it's, not, it's not just me. It became sort of everybody. I went to Chris mm. um, and Beth Heath behind Shropshire Fest festivals i went to beth and, and and ben and i said look this is what we like to do do you think we can do it and can you help and everybody that i spoke to said yes and all of the people involved in you know in this event are making it what it is so. nervous first one is, oh, a, is I'm, a bit of... I'm absolutely petrified all i keep saying to everyone is just pray for you know some sunshine yeah. you know um, but or everything is undercover and it's all about information so Rain. Oh, frankly, or there's sun. a lot of great food there. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, go and fill your boots. <laughs> exactly. So you know, we are hopeful um, that uh, everyone's going to turn out for us on Saturday because if they do, what they're going to see is is brilliant. If I say so myself. Mm. <laughs> has this been professionally as, as somebody who works in restaurants, and uh, has this been the biggest change recently? The the amount you have to take into consideration on your menu. Um, Almost. I think. The last sort of five, six years. Yeah, uh, that recent. And it's changed, yeah, because there was a change in the law with the, with the allergens for us. Right. So there's 13 allergens um, on, the, on the FSA list. And every chef basically in the country had to do that. On, it was an online test. Mm. Um, and it changed the way that we label uh, everything. So... Even in the restaurant, you know, if, you, if you're making something that contains peanuts, yeah. you have to say that it contains peanuts. And how careful do you have to be when you're making something uh, with peanuts you've in? Got to be, you've got to be pretty careful. And, and equally, it's things like um, vegetable oils that you can buy will contain gluten. Mm. And also, if you're cooking gluten, if you're doing fish and chips in a fryer, you can't then cook something in it for a silly yeah. act because that oil irrespective of whether you've drained it, yeah. still has traces of gluten. It depends on the level of intolerance as well. Because, you know, I know people that are allergic to peanuts, severely allergic, and then somebody has a mild. So you've got to be, you know, you've got to be extremely mindful all the time, but also you've got to be realistic. Because if you can't, you know, if I've got sesame and I've got peanut, and somebody comes in with an, both of those allergies, yeah. I have to say that... Yes, we've got a kitchen. So your food will be prepared in a separate area. Mm. However, those two those two potential allergens are in the same kitchen. Yeah. You know? And you'll see that you'll see that on, on modern day packaging, you know, um this biscuits like you've got some yeah. biscuits there. May contain. Might, no, not may contain, are made in a oh, factory. In a, that, oh it literally says that. Yeah, it oh, literally right, okay. says that. So when when the when the allergen thing came in, it was really big and the environmental health were really hot on it. And, and actually they did have the message and they did it, they did it in a way that now everybody has to do it and yeah. everybody conformed, everybody moaned at the time. But actually it made chefs more aware because we could see the way the wind was blowing because, mm. you know, it made... Because the last thing you want to do is alienate customers. Yeah. First and foremost, because uh, you know, as as chefs and and people that work in the front of house, you know, that's the livelihood. So you don't want to alienate anybody. But actually, if you can educate yourself, mm. then you can give um, somebody that's a celiac, a severe celiac, just as good a food experience as somebody that hasn't. Yeah. And and really, that's that's. That's the sort of thing. You don't want to alienate people. You actually want to embrace them and, you know, like Ria said, it's education. Mm. Now, 
Maisie said, I've got a dairy fact, which piqued my interest. She sent it to me. She says, um, Australian Aboriginals are a, a lot of them um, lactose intolerant due to not being exposed to cows, basically not having cows as a as a farmed animal. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and also right. a high percentage of Afro-Americans are also uh, dairy intolerant more than seeing Caucasian populations. So when you have issues, I mean, you spoke a little bit about sort of training yourself. You mm -hmm. can build up tolerance it, it depends what it is there, right. there are certain things i mean one of the things that that i look at and one of the things that i'm going to be doing at the festival is looking at epigenetic body types so these are genetic predispositions that exist in certain aspects of the population mm. and so there are certain predispositions that myself as a uh, was known as an adrenal type actually i find it really difficult to process casein which is found mainly in cheese and also something called alpha solanine how did you find out what sort of type you are uh, this is exactly what I'm doing at the right. festival, so you can come along with myself and my colleague Maria Franklin from Centre for Integral Health here in Shrewsbury. We're going to be demonstrating uh, in the workshop area where we are, we're going to be demonstrating uh, epigenetic body typing with people. So you can come along, we'll do some kinesiology, do some muscle testing and show you without a doubt exactly what type you are. Uh, because interestingly enough, our, our genetic morphology, so like the proportion of our fingers to the size of our palms, our height, and a number of other factors, all he did give this away. to me. He did this to me really? at the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. What what did it teach you? Um, I shouldn't eat tomatoes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, true yeah, story, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I shouldn't yeah. eat tomatoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's part of the the nightshade family, and so all of the nightshade family. There, there are two really interesting toxins in the nightshade family. Uh, one is alpha solanine, uh, which which is uh, one of the things that makes uh, certain parts of the population more prone to arthritis because the solanine increases inflammation in the joints if you're prone to it. And also something called atropine, uh, which used to be known just as tomato toxin. Uh, <laughs> and again, this is something we find in the nightshade family. So there are certain compounds that certain genetic profiles, because there's either information that's not there or, or something else has happened within that genetic profiling over long periods of history, and those bodies just can't process that information mm. and so there's always going to be some sort of reaction to it whether it's something that's severe or something that's minor but uh, we're, we're going to be looking at that uh, with people at the festival to to give them ideas because these are not allergies or low tolerances these are just the way your body's going to look at this thing and it's not quite the same uh, but there, there are certain people that just can't cope with certain foods certain people definitely can't process gluten certain people definitely can't process dairy produce but there's a there's about 50 15 food toxins that we look at and they include things like tyramine which you find in aging and mature foods, uh, the atropine that I've mentioned, a theobromide which is in chocolate, uh, things like betaine that you get in beetroot and sugar beets. So there are, there are certain compounds that are only found in certain foods, but some people just can't metabolize them and therefore they're always going to contribute towards ill health a little bit like putting the wrong fuel in your car you know cars aren't as forgiving as our bodies yeah. so you know you put it in the car and the car will start to complain pretty quickly but the body has a way of kind of getting around it for a while but part of what we see is as people get older these problems start to increase and, and often we get told well it's just your age you know you can expect it but really it's about extended bad habit and the body coping for a certain amount of yeah. time but getting to a point where it just can't adapt around it anymore and with maybe stress from lifestyle you know hectic schedule whatever else that's going on you know even things like surgery or accidents can increase the level of stress that a body's under so add to that things from a poor diet or a difficult relationship or a, a boss that you don't get on with yeah. and the body is just like i can't do this anymore something's got to change so it's fascinating so when did it start so we are opening our um, gates yeah. um, at the showground at 10 o'clock on Saturday. Um, and then the cookery theatre kicks off at 11, lecture theatre at 11.45. And on the gate, just turn up. So tickets are available in advance on Eventbrite or on the Festival website um, until Friday afternoon. Uh, they are, I think the early bird tickets are £6.40. Okay. Uh, it's £8 on the gate. And children are under 16 are free. <clears throat> Lovely. Well, good luck. And I think we've just about scratched the surface, so I'll have to have you back <laughs> and do this in a bit more depth because I, I feel like I'm learning an awful lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shri uh, Shropshire Festival. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, is, uh, is this weekend.
Madonna. Red Light on BBC Radio Shropshire. More festival chat, or a big gig at least, after the news at nine o'clock. Music from the Pet Shop Boys to come before that. BBC Introducing in Shropshire with Simon. I'm going to play you a track. It's a new one from an artist who's been sending us music for a while. It's a new track called Everybody Free. What uh, did you discover today as I, well? <laughs> it's, by the, it's by an artist called Koala T. And I... I <laughs> Stop it, Maisie. I will explain why Maisie is laughing at me because it was a revelation. Absolute revelation. A light bulb. Quality. Came on. Quality, quality, quality. Oh, my <laughs> word. That has eluded me for three years. Introducing Shropshire's best new music Saturday evening from 8 on BBC Radio Shropshire. Savaretti, Love on the Line on BBC Radio Shropshire. News to come with Moira at nine. Pet Shop Boys will get you there.